Okay, so uh, I'm glad that I have the chance to discuss this exciting topic. Um, the topic is, as you can see, AI, the silent revolution unveiled. I'm Boris Chobnik, and uh, my relationship to this topic is not, I'm not uh, an AI developer. I'm a user and uh, I am an investor into this technology. And uh, from this uh, perspective, I will be looking at things as a regular user as an, as, and also as a person that has uh, a chance to influence the future of this market uh, and our life, obviously. So, language. Language is the word that I want you to have, to have in mind because this will be the common denominator for this discussion. We, as humans, we use language to communicate, but uh, we achieved great success in teaching computers to use our language. Computers can um, use words, they can form meaningful sentences, but language is not just words, it's also music, it's uh, uh, pictures. So basically, we computers are having great success in learning how to use our human language uh still a work in progress but we have no idea how computers actually work and uh, we have little understanding of how these uh models that we develop so eagerly how they actually operate and with this uh, we have some concerns and i will discuss this in a second so without further ado <laughs> This is a brief list of what I'm going to show today. I will start by explaining what is AI, some history, and then you can see I am discussing revolutions. So because uh, the name of the lecture suggests a revolution, uh, there are some revolutionary elements to AI. So I will give examples. Some examples are provocative, <laughs> and I will happily discuss all your questions in the end. So let's, let's go. So, uh, intelligence, uh, definition first. So, the, as far as I know, there are at least 50 definitions for artificial intelligence. It's, it's really hard to choose one. I chose this one. Intelligence is the ability to accomplish complex goals. Uh, it was offered by Max Tegmark, which is a Swedish-American uh, physicist. He is also a professor in MIT, and he is an expert in machine learning. He's doing his research. I like this definition because, well, uh, if you look at it, uh, I can ask a rhetoric question here. You, is this definition limited to living creatures? Or does AI have to be conscious of the world around it? Does it have to be physically uh, interactive with the world? So, no, as you can see, as this uh, simple definition suggests, basically, if you can accomplish complex goals, you are intelligent. So, uh, there, there is more to it, obviously. There are different types of artificial intelligence and we have to differentiate for this discussion. We have artificial narrow intelligence. Uh, it can accomplish tasks in narrowly defined domains. For example, just writing text or, write, or just you know analyzing some patterns. And there is... Uh, general intelligence which is very similar to what uh, we as humans know to do we can walk we can speak we can sing we can do a bunch of stuff uh, and this is a general uh, well it's a broad list of tasks so uh, there is another there is a third one actually and this is the third uh, that the, the, the type that people fear the most this is artificial super intelligence uh, it's when uh, AI can do what we cannot understand what it does. It can basically build AI for itself to achieve more goals. So when an, an AI can construct <laughs> general AI and narrow AI by himself, uh, we have no control over the process. But the good news is that we are far from this. Um, so this is as far as definitions go. Now history. People were talking and speculating about the idea of machines uh, being intelligent for, for, for decades. You, have, you see here a picture from a newspaper from 1945, but actually, uh, you know, this kind of um, discussions were f for centuries, not, not just for, uh, for decades. 
but more practical history started about uh, in 1955. So you can see here on the left, uh, two guys. Uh, one is uh, Herbert and the second one is Alan. Basically, Herbert was going to a company and he was consulting a company that was called Rand Corporation. And at some point he saw that this company had machines that were printing out maps using letters and digits. And he came to a realization that, uh, that machines could manipulate these symbols and simulate a decision making process. So he joined with uh, Alan and some other guy that, uh, well, contributed less. That's why he is not on the picture. And they built the first artificial intelligent program. And they presented it in 1956 uh, in, a, in, in, a, in a conference for, uh, dedicated for artificial intelligence. The thing is uh, that on the right you can see uh, guys from that conference, actually 50 years later. Uh, and uh, at that point of time, they joined just to discuss theoretically uh, if they should add uh, AI as a research field in MIT. So they were just uh, entertaining the idea of a possibility. And those guys from the left, they came and they presented something that was already done. This was a proof that you don't have to speculate about the possibility here. We built a program and that program uh, was able to um, prove mathematical theorems the way humans do. It's kind of complex. It's more than just solving simple mathematical equation. So uh, these guys, uh, they built something that was able to think like a human and uh, do. You could say that this is an example of artificial narrow intelligence that was able to solve mathematical uh, theorems. So uh, the guys on the right, you can see uh, 50 years later, because why 50 years? Uh, because uh, the event was called, uh, I have a note here. It was 50 years. Oh, I can zoom in. No, it doesn't say here. Anyway, it, it was 50 years into the future of AI. So they met in 2006, uh, 50 years later, after 1956. And the guy in the middle is uh, Marvin Minsky. He was an avant-garde in this industry. He was, he is the reason why it got so much attention. He was talking to the media. He was making sure that uh, they were receiving enough funds for this to become a, a real research field in the universities. And DARPA uh, back in 1956 put some initial money and uh, created this program in MIT and other universities as well. So uh, history, you can see this guy on the right. He is uh, in MIT lab playing with some AI that is uh, moving blocks. And uh, on the left, you see the history. So. In 56, DARPA uh, financed the first research field. Then in the 70s, because Minsky was so much in the middle of everything, he has, he had this, uh, you know, false feeling that we're, uh, we're going to change the world so fast and so soon. So he said to Life magazine, in from three to eight years, we will have a machine with general intelligence of an average human being, which means it will not just be able to solve, uh, you know, like narrow tasks, but it would be able to talk, to speak, to go, to sing, to whatever. So this is uh, what we have usually where we are in the middle of in the middle of the whole thing. You know, when there is hype, you, you can feel that you're so close. You're so close to, to achieve a breakthrough. So you can see it was in the 70s and we are still nowhere near. Well, actually, we are near achieving general intelligence now. Uh, but back then it seemed so close. And uh, I will explain what happened uh, in a second. But for many people, you know, like the revolution came two years ago when, with the appearance of ChatGPT, and many people were so mm, sure, so, so so certain that you know AI is is now. It's it has never been th there before. And here you go. I show you that actually we are uh, looking and investigating and researching AI for decades now. So in '86. Uh, Carnegie Mellon introduced the first autonomous car. It was called NavLab. This is how it looked. It could drive uh, by itself, but if a driver wanted to take control, he could sit at the driver's seat and, well, basically take control. Uh, then in 97, 
another AI was finally able to beat a human player at chess. Again, this is a very narrow uh, task, but it was still a ma major milestone for AI. You can see the emotions. You can see on the bottom picture, you know, some people are excited, some people are sad. Definitely Gary Kasparov was sad. <laughs> Anyway, at the same year, another company, Dragon System, released the first publicly available speech recognition software. We are talking about 25, 26 years ago and, uh, and more. So AI is with us for quite some time now. And this is something I wanted to emphasize. Now, uh, not everything was great. And uh, remember, Mink, uh, he, he, he was, Minsky was, was so sure that uh, we were going to build general AI soon, back in the 70s. But uh, what happened, happened uh, what, what we call the Moravex paradox. Actually, uh, very soon, uh, everybody realized that uh, not everything is so simple with AIs. And uh, First, the, the, the first problem was lack of computational power. You couldn't do anything substantial. Computers simply couldn't uh, store enough information and they couldn't process it fast enough. So this was the first issue. And second, uh, the paradox basically uh, is about um, the uh, contrary to traditional assumptions, reasoning actually requires very little computation, but Everything that is related to, you know, motion, to touching stuff, to feeling stuff, to walking, this is the difficult pr uh, processes. This is this requires uh, very complex skills from computers, which which they couldn't uh, learn so fast as fast as we thought they would. You can see here he he compares this guy. He compares it to a one-year-old. We, we look at a little human, right? And he already can walk and he can touch stuff. Uh, he cannot really solve mathematical equations, but he can do basic stuff for us. But for us, it's basic, but uh, it turned out to be very complex. The solving the mathematical equations is actually the simple part. So uh, here is another guy. He's a cognitive psychologist from Canada. And he says, um, the main lesson of 35 years of AI research is that the hard problems are easy and the easy problems are hard. It took time to understand. And uh, here is a map on the left, which basically shows what tasks are easy for AI and which are complex. Uh, so to play Go, to play chess, to do arithmetic is on the sea level. It's, it's simple. But if you go up, uh, you climb to the mountains, you can see that some tasks are very hard for AI. Now we know. Um, so, because, uh, because of this uh, realization, many investors lost their patience and uh, funding was slowing down. But regardless of slowing funding, somehow this industry still thrived and achieved a lot of progress. Can you guess why? Well, it's a rhetoric question, don't answer. I will tell you, <laughs> it's because of Moore's law. So remember I told you that one of the uh, issues was that uh, there was not enough computational power in the beginning. So Moore's law suggests that every couple of years your computational power doubles, basically. So it happens not because of AI, it happens because people just want to use more computers and they need more processing power. So, But it, it really was uh, an enabler for this whole industry, even though funding was slowing down because, you know, investors finally realized that it's not happening as fast as uh, some of the uh, experts predicted. Still, uh, because you had more computing power, uh, engineers, AI engineers were able to achieve a lot. So this is uh, as far as old history goes, now current history. So we all know, well, I'm guessing that most of you heard about ChatGPT by now. So if you don't know what it is, basically it's a language model that has a chat and you can talk and it can give you suggestions. It can analyze information in textual form. So uh, this is something I ran just, uh, just to show you an example, uh, some business ideas that require no money. And here you go. I, I got a, an answer from ChatGPT. You can use it. It's 
it takes less than a minute. I asked, I even asked for a script for today's presentation. So it gave me recommendations for slides and it even suggested visual examples on those slides. Here example, for example, in slide number three, you can see types of AI. Uh, ChatGPT said, well, Boris, when you demonstrate the idea of narrow AI and general AI, you could, you could uh, add an image of a split screen that's showing a robot uh, or vacuum cleaner, which is a, an example of narrow AI, and a humanoid robot that can walk, talk, you know, like do a lot of stuff. So, you know, instead of going and drawing this by myself, I went to another AI and I just copy pasted this text. And uh, here you go. This is, uh, the, the thing is, this is absolutely new creation. This is something that never existed before. It's not like it looked in some database and found me these images. It's absolutely drew them from scratch. So here you go. You have you have a split screen and a, and a vacuum cleaner and a humanoid robot. So just, uh, you know, as you go to another doctor for a second opinion, I went to another AI and I asked it to do the same. Here is another option from a different AI, not really a split screen, but you, you can see uh, <laughs> what I asked for. Anyway, uh, this is this. These are just examples of what people are uh, getting so excited about in these days. And uh, this is the topic of generative AI. So this is the first revolution among the four revolutions that I'm planning to show you today. So what is generative AI? Uh, basically, it's an AI that capable of generating text, images, or other media to, in response to prompts. The name suggests generating something. But I have news to you. Not all AI can uh, or required to generate content. Actually, uh, there, there are a lot of uh, amazing uh, solutions in the, in the market uh, which use AI and they do not generate anything. And I will show you. Uh, in fact, uh, I mentioned that I come from uh, from an angle of investments, uh, VC investments. So uh, we, uh, our team invested in, in some of those companies and I will show you some examples as well. Uh, anyway, about generative AI, here are some, uh, you know, uh, groups within this group. So basically you have language models like ChatGPT or BART from Google. You, you have those that generate images, you have those that generate music, videos. An example of uh, an AI that generates videos, just a fun uh, example. So there is one startup, uh, how it's called Fable Simulation. It creates uh, South Park episodes from whatever you want. If you want to ask it to create an episode of aliens coming to Australia and talking to kangaroos, it will create an episode about that with, uh, you know, like uh, cartoons from that uh, movie and with their voices. Here, I will even put a short script, a short example. You can appreciate yourself. Guys, have you heard about the Screen Actors Guild strike? Yeah, it's all over the news. That sucks. Does that mean there won't be any new shows coming out? Exactly, There's no voice. Man. And that's where my business idea comes in. <laughs> I'm glad you asked, Kenny. It's called Queepy, a deep fake streaming service. Wait, what? Deep fake? Cartman, that's illegal and unethical. No, no, no. It's genius. We take existing shows and movies and just replace the actors with deep fake versions of other famous people. Like imagine Game of Thrones, but with Danny DeVito as Daenerys. Anyway, uh, there is sound. I mean, like it's just uh, not that loud. Anyway, uh, even if you couldn't uh, hear it, there were subtitles. I liked that they would put Danny DeVito as Daenerys from Game of Thrones uh, with the deep fake technology. So basically, it's absolutely a uh, well, fake episode that was created using this AI. Uh, I enjoyed this example, so I decided to show you. So mm, more in this uh, segment, you have, wait. Yeah, so you have also generative AI that can program code. Some people even speculated and said this is the end of programming, which is not true, but this is still very, very revolutionary. Uh, you have even an AI that you can tell him, you can describe a game that you want to create and it will create a game for you. This is amazing. 
uh, you can create websites and you can also create uh, human or like digital personas of real people. You can clone yourself. And uh, <laughs> the reason why I'm bringing this as an example is because you see this pretty face. So, oh, sorry. So basically, uh, this is a Snapchat influencer. Her name is uh, Karin Marjorie or, or something like that. I'm hope, I hope I pronounce it right. So she decided that you can, uh, well, you can you can subscribe for one dollar per minute to have her as a digital girlfriend of yours. So uh, after one week, uh, she already had eleven thousand boyfriends, and uh, she was generating one hundred thousand dollars only after one week. So basically, she created a clone of herself that was talking to her to her followers. At some point, it went. <laughs> Uh, it, it went badly because, uh, okay, so uh, let me just read this to you. She says that at some point the chatbot engaged in sexually explicit conversation with some of its subscribers, which is something that it wasn't programmed to do. And now she and her team are fighting to, you know, like fix, to censor the, this AI chatbot because, well, it's, it's not her. Uh, anyway. She says that this uh, solution can generate her five million dollars per month. So that's kind of you know like what technology can do. Obviously, she is not you know the smartest person on the planet. So a week later, this girl from OnlyFans decided that she is creating a digital girlfriend uh, version of herself as well. So <laughs> uh, anyway, I will wrap it up with generative AI. Uh, I wanted to show you this, but I'm not sure if you will hear the, the, the music, but, uh, the, you know, like before, just, I will explain the, the idea behind this before, if you were a, an artist and you had the music, you had some song that you're singing and you wanted to create a video clip, you will have to pay a lot of money to, to work a lot on it and to make it interesting for your followers to, uh, you know, to watch this was this was created by ai uh, the only thing that was real here is the song by uh by resonate which is called canvas so i will i will just put it for 10 15 seconds in case you you can hear it tune in out of starlight the innocent lifetime flickers and flashes under a canvas no no Nobody seems worth it while the feeling sophisticated the view is so restrained Anyway if you cannot hear the song uh, you're welcome to find it on YouTube it sounds really great and what I like about this uh, editing by AI it actually has even uh, words embedded into the video Play it. Wanna have to give a damn about you? So it's like karaoke version Boy as well. Anyway, skipping wrong. forward. You're the one who told me. Okay, so uh, now you know. Uh, generative AI is one of the revolutions that I was talking about, and uh, many people are so uh, focused on it that they absolutely miss the the full picture here. That there. There is much more to AI than just generative AI. Uh, and also, uh, there are some issues with it. Now, one of the issues that I chose to, to talk about is the legal issue, uh, issue of ownership. So this is a paper that was published by Science recently, but you know there, there are many people that are occupied with this problem. You have something which is generated, some content, but who owns it? And uh, can you can you charge money for it? So imagine uh, there is an artist. He paints an actual painting, and then you have AI that looks at this painting and draws something similar. So the artist can say that uh, AI's drawing is actually a derivative of his art, and he would partially be right. But then the AI developers can come and say, well, making this derivative is the most difficult part. So the rights are reserved to the AI model, uh, <laughs> but but there is a problem with that approach as well because a legally uh, copyright laws 
uh, were not written for machines. They were written only for humans. So legally speaking, at least, uh, we are not there to claim rights for an AI model. Uh, and also, uh, the second point is that in the AI by itself would not generate anything. It needs a human prompt. So basically somebody, some human, uh, had to, to write the prompt and then the AI would generate something, right? So in that sense, uh, the human that wrote the prompt might argue that the secret source is in his creative prompt. And uh, that's why the rights should belong to him. You know, who is right? So many questions and no answers, no definite answers at least. You know, what, what usually these models do, they, they add uh, terms and conditions and uh, they make you agree on certain things before they give you the, to use their model. So I went to Mid Journey, for example, I read their terms and conditions. And you can say, you can see that you own all assets you create, but there are exceptions. And the exception is that you have to be a paid member. <laughs> However, if you're not a paid member, you can still uh, use uh, the content, but you have to attribute them and you have to say that, well, it was, it was done by, uh, with, with Mid Journey. Okay. So it's, it's okay, I guess. But uh, this whole issue of uh, ownership is still being investigated and I think the legal system is, is well, behind that. So nobody actually knows. Like even I, if I, if I uh, you know, use images in this presentation, well, who, like what should I do? Is, are they mine or sh are there <laughs> open AIs or whatever? Anyway, another issue is privacy. Uh, you can read in the news, especially here in Europe, you, you know, GDPR and everything. A lot of people are concerned about who is uh, sharing what and how is it being used. And uh, the thing is, these models, they were trained on information. And sometimes this information was already private. You know, like people were leaving a lot of private information in the Internet. And uh, who knows? Who knows what o OpenAI, the company behind ChatGPT, used? to train its model. Uh, so, you know, like there are two questions here. Can you ask them to, well, remove something that you don't want to be there? And I look at this as uh, baking a cake. You know, you can bake a cake after it's baked. You cannot remove ingredients. You cannot, you know, like you decide suddenly that you don't want sugar in the cake and just, you know, get it out. It's, it's the same with these models. Uh, the, the way, the way they're being trained, well, does not really allow to subtract stuff from them after that. What you can do, you can decide to begin with which ingredients you put into the cake before you bake it. So for future uh, models, maybe, maybe you can uh, require by regulation, you know, like what data they can use and what not. But right now people already are using this around the world. And uh, the second, the second part to this problem is that people now share information you know like willingly after the model was already trained and this information also being absorbed by these models what happens with that information can you somehow you know regulate that so there are a lot of issues with these models uh, but uh, you know i i believe that uh, human nature is if we see a lot of benefits and something we really don't care about all the other stuff even if uh, long term it's really bad for us you know how many of you uh, be, just be honest with yourself. How many of you read uh, the terms and conditions of apps that you install on your phones? N not really, right? Like, <laughs> we just want to use them. So I'm really uh, skeptical about, you know, like uh, efficient regulation of privacy or, uh, or, or even ownership rights in the future for this technology. Okay, enough with the issues. Uh, what is what is else out there? I told you that it's not only generative AI. AI uh, can do a lot of things. So here are some examples. For example, you can give AI medical uh, results uh, of your health, maybe some scans, and it can give you his, well, its opinion. This is not generative AI. This is looking into patterns. This is something else that AI is very good at doing. Another example is, uh, well, cars that can drive uh, autonomously. Uh, also, nothing to be generated there. They just analyze uh, the environment around them. 
fraud prevention. We actually have a company that we invested uh, in uh, and it scans human behavior. Like if something is, is doesn't look, uh, you know, like normal to what people usually do when they go and log in into a banking application, whatever, uh, then AI can really tell and it can do it very efficiently and live. So uh, you can see this is an example of, uh, you know, what kind of technologies uh, can make the world a better place and uh, they have nothing to do with generative AI. And it's important to support technologies like this. Now, uh, another example is, well, you all know, uh, you can talk to your phone, right? And it can, uh, you, you can, you can do voice to text and you, you can also hear from your, uh, you know, virtual assistant with human voice. So this is also, this is also, uh, AI, not necessarily generative, especially, um, Okay, okay, this is this can be partially generative, depends how you use it. Anyway, um, there are many, many examples. I cannot show you everything. I just wanted to show you that generative AI is a tip of the iceberg and there is actually a lot in this uh, industry, uh, which is interesting and can disrupt the world for better or for worse. Uh, we'll discuss it a bit later. Now, a provocative question. <laughs> who is better now uh, you know there are a lot of uh, tests and humans uh, you know go and they, they have these SATs in the United States you have uh, you know have all, all kind of tests you know IQ tests the one that I really uh, like here in this comparison to chat GPT-4 is the theory of mind and for those of you who uh, don't know what is theory of mind here, Wikipedia ha can help. Basically, this is a very important thing. This is uh, our ability to sense uh, the mental states of the people around us, to feel their emotion. Basically, th this is our ability uh, to be em empathetic. You know, th without this, we cannot have empathy. So the, uh, <laughs> the thing is that, you know, the, the model the models were, uh, are so good now that you can see that ChatGPT even beats the average human in that. The average human is less empathetic, is is less uh, well attuned to to feelings of others than ChatGPT. You have you have a machine that is more human than than a human. So this for for me it was a revelation. I mean it, this is absolutely amazing, and. Uh, with this kind of uh, a machine, uh, because it's so empathetic, because it, it can feel uh, your mood, it can uh, respond uh, appropriately to your mood, you can, you can uh, create deep and meaningful uh, emotional uh, connections with this kind of you know, intelligence, even though it's an artificial intelligence. So uh, this is absolutely mind blowing for me. Uh, I'm, I'm, I, for me, it was kind of uh, uh, obvious that it will beat me at some tests, you know, like SATs. Uh, but it, f to sense uh, emotions of others, uh, th this was not obvious, not to me anyway. Anyway, next. The next revolution, I call it see the unseen. And what I mean by that is, you know, I described to you our human language, our human uh, ways to communicate with others. And I, I mentioned in the beginning that computers, they have ways to communicate of their own. And they can see the world, they can perceive the world in different way uh, from what we uh, know how to do. So here is an example. Uh, imagine this, a simple device as a Wi-Fi router was used by AI to watch people and what they're doing behind walls. Imagine somebody seeing you in your private space at home, seeing what you are doing, uh, not even present in the same room with you. And for this, it does not require not cameras, not uh, none of the optical devices that we normally, you know, think about. Uh, just a simple device. Well, now it's relatively simple. It's just, just a small device that emits 
radio frequencies to share internet with you, right? But it can see you physically, not your online presence. It can see what you're doing, how you're moving. Uh, now, I'll show you how it looks. So, by the way, this is the same company that uh, I mentioned before. You see Carnegie Mellon. Um, uh, they are the ones that uh, introduced the first autonomous driving vehicle in 1986. So, at first, uh, AI was connected to to, to these cameras, optical cameras that could, you know, watch the people. And uh, it was reading signals, both visual and, you know, ele electromagnetic signals from the Wi-Fi router. And at some point the cameras were disconnected, but somehow the AI still wanted to fill the gaps because it knows what it's supposed to see. So it found a way, it found a way by itself uh, <laughs> to see what was missing. Interesting, right? Still not very creepy because, okay, I mean, like, uh, it's not that bad, but I, I will show you. It gets, it gets more interesting. Now, another example of how computers can see is uh, this guy, uh, Bjorn. Uh, he created a camera that doesn't use any optical uh, lens to make photos. So, uh, the way it works, it scans, again, the same principle with electromagnetic waves, so you can see some antennas on this camera. It scans the environment and then he uh, sets some parameters for the generative AI to draw uh, the environment around him. So basically he can set the temperature, the time of the day, the weather conditions, and then I think it's connected to DALI, uh, another AI that generates, uh, you know, images and then using this uh, inform data that he collected with his antennas he can he can pretty much uh, draw very realistic photos of uh, what the camera captured uh, you can see on the top left uh, an example he he stands in the street this is an actual photo and on the right you can see what the artificial intelligence generated using the description and the and the data that he collected it looks pretty realistic to me. Now, here is the creepy part. Well, maybe not creepy, maybe just to me. But I told you, computers uh, learned to see things that we don't see. This, this examples, you know, like of watching people behind walls is one thing. But what about reading your <laughs> thoughts? <laughs> yes, artificial intelligence knows how to read your thoughts you don't have to speak uh you can be dreaming and it will be reading your dreams so basically what uh, researchers did here they showed people uh you know images for example you take a teddy bear on the left you show it to a person at that point they take an fmri take an fmri scan of his brain and then they take the static scan and they show it to ai and AI, AI was able to reconstruct, based on the image of the brain scan, what the person was thinking about. You can see on top the actual images that people were looking at, and at the bottom you can see the reconstruction by AI. And it looks, well, it's not perfect, <laughs> but the idea that uh, AI can read your mind, uh, well, it, it, it makes many people uncomfortable. Seeing you behind walls, you know, eating dinner <laughs> or watching TV is not as scary as reading your mind, right? Uh, anyway, so this is uh, revolution number two. Revolution number three, what is real? You probably heard by now uh, the word deep fake. This is Papa. Uh, and uh, obviously he does not wear the, these clothes, but you know the internet was full of pictures generated by Midjourney, the a AI that generates images of uh, him going in this uh, fashion brands. And uh, <laughs> some people even believed, uh, even though it was uh, disp uh, disproved very fast. Uh, but you know, this is a static image, so okay. You can fake an image. You could fake an image before using Photoshop, right? Even without, you know, like a very huge progress in AI. What about uh, videos? 
okay i will not show everything i have four but we are kind of short in time uh i i i have here uh, different videos of presidents as you can see everything is fake none of these videos uh, are with actual people but they're so realistic and people uh, tend to believe uh, to what they see and hear because the voice is of the person and the appearance the looks of, of the person uh the the top right one you can see this is a joke but it 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 was amusing to me. You can you can uh, go, go find it in YouTube later. It's President Donald Bean. It's basically uh, Mr. Bean face on uh, President Trump's body and voice. I will show you the one that uh, I like the most, Morgan Freeman. Uh, again, I will show you, but if you can't I am hear not it, Morgan Freeman, and what you see is not real. Well... At least in contemporary terms, it is not. What if I were to tell you that I am not even a human being? Would you believe me? What is your perception of reality? Is it the ability to capture, process, and make sense of the information our senses receive? If you can see, hear, taste, or smell something, does that make it real? Or is it simply the ability to feel. I would like to welcome you to the era of synthetic reality. Now, what do you see? Anyway, I'm not sure how much of it you could hear, but I, I enabled subtitles so you could at least read. It sounds very, very realistic. So uh, what I showed you, you cannot trust images, you cannot trust videos. Basically, uh, what happens next is, wait, Lifeug. voice. Uh, and it, this is very simple, actually. You have uh, Microsoft has this and also Meta has this. Pretty much, uh, you don't require much to fake voice uh, and it will give you a 100% match. So basically, it takes only three seconds to capture your voice signature. And then you can tell the AI here. This is example of Microsoft. This is example of Meta. Uh, you can see uh, prompts of text that you can tell the AI to speak with the voice that was captured. And it, it not only that it captures the voice, it can also capture the um, well, how you speak, you know, your emotions, if you if you are angry scared or happy it can it can it can use it uh it's very realistic so revolution number three is what is real if you cannot trust voice if you cannot trust video if you cannot trust images well basically nothing digital can be trusted what do you do right uh this technology actually can be used for good but it can also be used by scammers and uh, in United States, uh, it was already used by many scanner, scammers. They call you, they capture your voice, and then they go and they call your parents with your voice and ask for money. Basically, they tell you, I dad, uh, well, you know, like a son calling his dad and says, I'm in a hospital, I need to pay the doctor, can you please, you know, like uh, help me out? And then some parents will call the, their kids to just check if this is real some parents will just go and transfer the money so uh, you know technology can be abused mm, misused anyway uh, just you should know that, <laughs> that it's really hard to trust anything now with this uh, disruptive technologies you have to be informed and you have to be careful and uh, responsible about it now we'll talk about dangers of ai okay this was just the introduction this is what this was just so that you know uh, <laughs> that AI can do a lot and not just generate stuff. Um, so some of these dangers are well real, and some of them are just fears. I will read you something uh, that I really enjoyed reading when I saw it first. So it goes like this: day by day, however, the man the machines are gaining around ground upon us day by day we are becoming more subservient to them more men are daily bound down as slaves to tend them more men are daily devoting their energies 
sorry, the energies of their whole lives to the development of mechanical life. It really sounds familiar, right? It goes, it, it, it goes on. The upshot is simply a question of time, but that the time will come when the machines will hold the real supremacy over the world and its inhabitants is what no person of a truly philosophic mind can for a moment question. You know, when I read this uh, lines, I was like, wow, this is about AI. But no, this is Samuel Butler in 1863. He is a British novelist. And, uh, you know, like people always, always feared of progress, of machines, of uh, something new. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm having this discussion with you because we really we need to understand what are actual fears because of something dangerous that might happen. Uh, you know, how this technology can be misused, especially if they can see behind walls and read your <laughs> mind. Or, and what is, uh, what is called uh, metatheosio sorry, metatheosiophobia. Cannot pronounce it, but it means the fear of change. There is a word for it. So uh, you could you could probably read in the news that a lot of uh, you know famous people went out and asked to slow down. You can see Elon Musk on the left. You can see uh, Steve Wozniak, uh, the co-founder of Apple, uh, and this Andrew Yang. Uh, I think he is a politician and a businessman. There are a lot of famous people that come out and say, please. We are progressing too fast. We have no idea where we are going. We can get to some unintended uh, consequences. Please slow down, you know. And, uh, you know, you you understand that it's really hard to slow down progress. Uh, well, it, it never happened. Uh, never in history we could, you know, stop something or even significantly slow it down. Uh, but I would like to... Uh, calm you down and uh, the, the thing is first not everything that people are fearing of is uh, is real we'll go one by one now about on, on these fears and uh, even if it's real it's not happening tomorrow yet uh, because you know just as I showed you uh, as uh, Minsky was in the 70s telling well we are almost there seven eight years and that's it uh, things usually happen slower even if it looks like everything is happening so fast uh, but nevertheless, there are some actual dangers and I will talk about them as well. But you can do something about it. You can still do something and, uh, and we, we, in fact, as, an invest, as investors, we do something about it. We choose what to support, what not to support. We are kind of shaping the future together, the, the better future of tomorrow, you know, legal uh, system and everything. So there was a survey uh it, it's relatively recent and uh, the people that were uh, participating in this survey are not g the general public they're basically people that published papers on machine learning so you know they're in the field so they were asked different questions about the progress of ai and some of these questions um yeah existential risk <laughs> actually they were even asked about potential extinction and you know it it it's alarming when this kind of people that are, you know, like uh, familiar with the, with the, with this uh, industry, you know, very intimately, they tell you 50% of them tell you that there is a, a chance of, you know, human extinction uh, with a probability of 10% or higher, you know, so there is an actual risk, at least in, in their opinion. Uh, whether it's 10% or 50% or, or 1%, well, there, there, is, there is a risk, and uh, let's talk about it. Now, first, the common risks, I, I, you know, like I want to eliminate stuff so that we don't focus on them later on. So some people talk about, that, you know, threat to employment. Okay, yeah, some people will lose jobs, some people will get new jobs. A classic example is uh, there is, you know, like... Uh, a job which is called a dat data scientist and uh, you know to, to get uh, to work as a data scientist you have to study statistics mathematics you have to have a university degree so it's kind of you know like a very serious job but because of AI uh, you, you no longer have to do it 
you can employ what is called a citizen data scientist and it's a knowledge worker with without formal training and uh, he, he doesn't really know advanced mathematics or statistics but he can extract high, high value insights from data using ai so basically you know like one guy uh, lost his job but another guy that didn't have the background uh, found a new job so you know everything is changing i'm not looking at this as a serious threat to humanity now uh unintended consequences yeah this can happen especially if you do something that you do not fully understand and uh you know i i have a lot of evidence but i didn't show you in this presentation but really even the ai researchers that build these models they have well limited understanding of what's going on in those models uh, it's true especially when we are building deep learning models uh, with many many hidden layers i mean it's i don't want to get into the specifics of this because uh, this presentation is not technical but we don't really know what we are doing <laughs> really and unintended consequences is something that can happen here is as an example i i i bring, i give you a self-driving car that you know for some reason decided to damage property or, or you know drive over people or something this is definitely something we don't want uh it can happen propensity for bias yes people are biased and the data that we use is also from limited sources it can be biased everything can be biased here so this is another thing to be worried about but we are still not talking about the extinction of humankind right so people can lose jobs and maybe some cars will go you know crazy uh and they some chat will 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 uh, talk about white supremacy or something but this is still not ex extinction right uh absence of accountability well this is more of another uh, legal issue that i should have mentioned when i was talking about ownership rights and about privacy uh i think it's solvable at some point somebody will be accountable for the mistakes of the these models uh susceptibility to cyber threats this is really in interesting and i bring uh, more evidence to support my claims here because we actually this is what we do in uh, springtide uh, when we invest in these startups uh you know like uh, there, there are some cyber threats and uh you know when you are an investor you have you get the chance to choose which uh technologies you can support with finance with your uh, knowledge with your skills uh as a, as a as a person that goes and looks for a job you know you can also support this way but basic basically we all have a chance to influence and to uh shape the future so if there are solutions to these threats uh, i would gladly support and uh, invest in those solutions so i will show you what kind of threats we are talking on the cyber uh, security uh, arena so we have a thing a thing that's called adversarial attacks uh, this uh, picture pretty much captures the idea you can see two spider-mans they look alike they sound alike you know these words sound pretty similar at least to the to a person which <laughs> who has english as a second language uh but one of them is definitely fake right this is the idea about these attacks so there is uh okay one one chart i managed to squeeze into this uh, presentation not non-technical presentation anyway uh you have a training process of a model and uh, you know it's it iterative you train and then you get some feedback and you train again you collect data you add data you subtract anyway at many different points of this process you can uh you can add uh well uh, data which would ruin the end results okay so ma adversarial attacks are, are malicious attacks of data which can cause misclassification in the uh in the model i will give you an example you see on the left there is an ostrich but on the all the other pictures you also see something that looks exactly the same right but not for computers i told you computers speaks speak their own language so to humans it it all looks ostrich but for a computer because of some little difference in in how it looks uh it can it can be a vacuum cleaner okay so this kind of noise is the adversarial attack 
and it can be purposely inserted by a hacker and it can ruin the whole model and you know uh, here is an example so when you insert this noise it's called deceptive input uh, input so for, for example you take a picture of a panda and uh, you 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 give it together with this little little noise you know and with this noise together uh, AI thinks that it's actually a gibbon it's not a panda and it causes misclassification when this can be dangerous here is a car that tries to drive autonomously let's say we have a Tesla car here and uh, at some point this Tesla car just imagine you're trusting your car you're sitting relaxed in the back seat and some s s s and uh, suddenly your car thinks that a small boy on the road is just a candy and you know like you can go over a candy right you cannot go over a boy but you can go over a candy what if it mistake you know uh thinks <laughs> that it's not a boy it's 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 trouble in this example i showed you a police car that was uh, perceived by the model as cake you know you can go over a cake easily uh, but it's advised not to uh, go and hit police cars so uh this is about adversarial attacks mm, now weapons yeah ai can be used for good and can be used for bad uh so let's let's see what we have there we have uh, it's one thing when a human decides the final decision but the thing is we trust technology at some point so much that we no longer question its recommendations and you know it's technology it can be hacked with and it can have a mind of its own especially if we don't fully understand what we are building there right and uh, if those uh, weapons are you know like this drone if it only observes people this is one thing but if it has rockets or guns you know it can it can just kill somebody that that's trouble right especially if you add to these uh, robots the ability to see behind walls think you know like this robot comes to you interrogates you and asks you questions and you cannot even lie because it can read <laughs> it can read your mind <laughs> you know this is this is incredible what we achieved in such a short period of time with ai but uh if we don't learn how to uh, control and how to use it uh this can be the end of uh, humankind very very uh you know fast so it's very important to uh to, to influence how it shapes you know uh so it, it makes sense why so many people asked asked you know to slow down what uh, do we people do about these dangers? So, first of all, first of all, you can see that all the major countries are trying to weaponize their militaries with AI already. You can see it in the United States, you can see it in Israel, you can see it in China, and uh, the, there is uh, well, there is a race right now. So it, it's alarming. On the other hand, here in Europe uh this year 60 countries uh well signed on a pact that they will try to regulate artificial intelligence you know <laughs> those countries that uh participate in this craziness like united states and china they also signed this pact you know so because these pacts are so vague uh, nobody really controls anything and uh well okay <laughs> I don't want to go to you know to dark places but uh, I think we, we we should do more and we progress so fast and this kind of attempts to regulate this are uh, really lagging behind anyway um, final point over-reliance over-reliance uh, we trust systems so much especially when they learn to speak our language right so uh we develop deep emotional relationships with these uh, technologies uh imagine how much information you give your phone how much information you provide uh, all the apps on your phone you know you agree automatically to those terms and conditions so we are very trusting species and uh this over reliance and over trust can well, uh,
cost us, cost us, uh, sorry, cost us uh, dearly. So I'm moving to the uh, one of my final slides in the presentation. No, not the final. Wait, I have several more. Anyway, so this is the the trust issue. Uh, we do not always understand how it works, so we have no chance but to trust it. Uh, if we could understand, it would be much easier, right? Like we could check, we could uh, create some controls. But the thing about these models is that we don't understand. Even the most expert people in this industry, uh, they don't really know what's going on. I mean, like, yeah, it's, it sound it sounds like Boris here is lying right now. But if you really investigate this topic, uh, you will see that these experts can, well, describe in general the inputs and the outputs, but not what, everything in between. Uh, so we have no chance but just trust because we have no ability to understand. And we are talking about narrow artificial intelligence and sometimes some, something which is getting close to general artificial intelligence. We are not even at the super intelligence uh, that is beyond our cognitive ability to even understand what it does. Now, okay, we trust it, but what if uh, we let AI recursively improve itself? And we do that already. We tell AI, improve yourself. And, you know, like to begin with, we, don't, we didn't get what it did before. And now it uh, can uh, do these iterations so fast and it can advance so fast that can, it can, uh, you know, become <laughs> very advanced very fast. And we let it do. Uh, we let it do it. Yeah. So, uh, very interesting mm, philosophical discussion. I hope that mm, <laughs> next year we'll still have uh, humankind not extinct. Uh, I'm moving to the final point that I wanted to make. Actually, uh, full credit goes to Yuval Harari. He's a professor in uh, the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. He's uh, a futurist and he is a very uh, interesting person in general. If you, if you know him, great. He wrote books like uh, Sapiens and uh, well, I don't remember all the books, but he talks about AI as well, and this was uh, his speech uh, in Frontiers Forum uh, several months ago, I think two months ago. And uh, remember I told you that this is about language, and this is a real danger. Uh, when you combine this uh, idea that AI can speak our language, that it can feel our emotions, uh, can understand our emotional state, it can, it can bond with us on a deep level, uh, you understand that uh, with, AI, with language you can actually do a lot, a lot of good, a lot of harm. So I investigated, I investigated, I tried to understand what you can achieve by just using language. And uh, war, wars were started with, lang with just language. I, I found an example, uh, let, me, let me look, uh, yeah. So basically, uh, first of all, storytellers, uh, they invented gods, they invented religions. So just by using language, just by using words in the right combination, you can manipulate people, you can persuade people, you can convince to whatever. Uh, you can do it intentionally or unintentionally, right? Uh, so I'm not saying that uh, these models right now, they have a mind, you know, like a conspicuous mind to okay, let's trick these humans into thinking something. But what I'm saying that we are as species are hackable by means of language. Uh, there are a lot of cognitive biases that uh, can, could be used against us. It's well described in literature, the same literature that ChatGPT was training on. So basically, <laughs> he's fully aware of how to frame phrases, how to anchor our intention, uh, and use all those uh, effects on us because we are not perfect. So, uh, example that I found was that uh, Otto von Bismarck, actually the Chancellor of Prussia at the time, he just he took uh, something that King Williams, uh, King Williams said and rephrased it, 
so basically he took a text, changed the words a little bit, and then it caused uh, protesters in France to go to the streets. And then uh, Napoleon III did, had no choice but to go war, you know, France and Prussia. And it, this, is, this is what you can do with just words. So imagine a very sophisticated uh, intelligence uh, that at some point, well, might decide that it want to, I don't know, manipulate with human <laughs> beings. This is dangerous. Anyway, uh, this is it. Mm, I think, uh, oh, summary slide. We can influence. Yeah, I wanted to finish with a positive uh, message here. We can choose where to go slower and where to go faster. Um, we can support regulation, right? If we are aware of the problems, we can, you know, like uh, offer some solutions. We can support awareness. That's what I'm doing right now. And we can support responsible investments. That's what, what we are doing in the, in the fund. Uh, and you can do it on a personal level as well. Uh, you can, if you see a startup that wants to make these models safer for example uh responsible you can give them money and you can decide not to give money for example to, to models that well are not controlled and can wipe us <laughs> uh, anyway uh thank you this is the time for questions i will 